Bibles, please, to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 9, as we're continuing our study through the book of 2 Samuel, and uh, the title of our message this morning, An Invitation to Eat at the King's Table. I love this story that's in chapter 9. It really is an encouragement, and God's heart is all through it, and so let's pray and then open our heart. Father, thank you for sending your word, for showing us your heart through your word, and we just want to receive. So, God, we come this morning asking that you would pour out your life, your spirit upon us, use the word of God to draw us into a deeper walk and a deeper faith with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's a tremendous story. David now, if you remember, he is uh, now anointed king over all of Israel. He comes to a point in his life where he steps back, looks at the amazing blessing of God. Nothing short of amazing. And he recognizes that this has been God. So he wants to do something for the Lord. Remember the story. He wants to build a house for the Lord in Jerusalem, the temple. He wants it to be grand, you know. And uh, so he told the prophet this and this was the answer that the Lord responded back. It's very important. Very, very important. Where God said to him, essentially, I love your heart, David. You did well in wanting to build a house for me, but you are not the one who will build that house for me. You are a man of war, a man of bloodshed. The one who will build my house will be a man of peace. However, because you wanted to do this for me, I will do something amazing for you. Now, I just love this. I will do something so amazing. I will give you a name. That's great. Like the great men of all the earth. And I will do something even more. I will build you an everlasting kingdom. Your throne will be established forever. That is a magnanimous blessing of God on him and of course you know this is fulfilled when Jesus the Messiah who comes at the end of the age will be called the son of David and David's uh, uh, name is further made a claim when God reveals his the nature of his character and his faith to the world which is one of the things we see in this chapter David's faith what happened was David was thinking back on the, 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 the friend that he had in Jonathan and the blessing that Jonathan was to, to David. Jonathan was Saul's son. Of course, Saul was his enemy, but Saul's son, Jonathan, was his friend. And he was thinking back on this amazing friend and how this amazing friend had stood up for him and then blessed him and stood faithfully to him all those years and how he had promised to Jonathan that he would bless his house all his days. He's thinking back about this amazing, have you ever done that, kind of look back on your life and thought of people who have really done something amazing? Really done something amazing to bless you. Think back and, and then, you know, you kind of, I, man, that, that was a really amazing thing they did for me. I, I was thinking, for example, when I was in sixth grade, 12 years old, I, I, I took uh, uh, from my music teacher, I was learning a guitar. She offered, you know, guitar after school. And so I was learning this. And so finally, at one point, she says to me, you, you need a, a more advanced teacher. Now, we couldn't afford. We were very poor, as you know. We were deeply in poverty. And uh, I said, well, we can't afford it. She says, I know. I've already made arrangements. She made arrangements for me to have a private teacher in Hillsborough. We lived way out in the hinterlands, you know, way in the North Mountains. And uh, she drove me to those classes, paid for them all, and drove all the way in Hillsborough, all the way back home. It's an hour drive and paid for it. I'm like... What teacher does that? And it changed my life. And uh, we stayed friends the rest of her life. And you think back on the people who've done amazing things. And this is what happened for David. Ever since the day that David killed that Philistine giant, Jonathan admired him. And they had such a bond. So David now, all these years later, is thinking. And so he inquires, is there anyone left of the house of Saul 
that I might bless him for the sake of my friend. And so he inquires, he hears that there is one remaining son, a son of Jonathan, and his name is Mephibosheth. And he is lame in both feet, which is an interesting story. And he's living in a place called Lodabar. Now, the name of the place kind of gives away a very important part of the story. Lo debar. Lo in Hebrew means no. Ken means yes. Lo means no. No debar. No, it means no pasture, no word, no thing. It's a nowhere, nothing town. You want to talk about a nothing town? It is in a desperate place. It's like, you know, Death Valley kind of thing. Nothing happens there. He's there because he's in hiding. Very common in those days when a king passed from one family to another that all the sons of that king would be killed. Very common in that day. So I said, make sure there's no uprising in the future. Now, how did he become lame in both feet is another interesting story. When his grandfather Saul was killed in battle, Mephibosheth was five years old. And his nurse, realizing the danger for all the sons and grandsons of the king, scooped him up and ran As she is running with the boy in her arms, she falls, and the boy uh, uh, then falls and breaks, we presume, both uh, uh, legs, both feet. Of course, without right and proper medical care, it's not set. And so he's lame the rest of his life. The rest of his life, he cannot walk properly. He's lame, he's in hiding, he's been there in Lodabar all those years. David hears, there's one left. His name is Mephibosheth. He's lame and he's living in Lodabar. David says, bring him to me. Can you imagine when uh, someone comes to Mephibosheth and says, "Um, King David knows who you are and he knows where you live and he wants to see you. Oh no. This is disaster. This is the worst day of my life. So he appears before David And David says, Mephibosheth, yes, don't be afraid. I will bless you today. What a great story. Let's read it. 2 Samuel chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Then David said, is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I might show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, well, there is one, still a son of Jonathan, who is crippled in both feet. The king said, where is he? Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. The king sent then and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face, prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he said, Here I am, your servant. David said to him, do not fear. He had every reason to fear. Don't fear. I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And listen to this amazing declaration. I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul. All of it is to be restored and given to you. And furthermore, you shall eat at my table. You know, the king would have a a, a table, the king's table, all the sons. It was a grand thing every evening, right? It was a grand thing. The king's table and the king's chefs, right? The king's provisions, the king's table. All the king's sons would eat there. David had many sons. And Mephibosheth, you can sit at my table regularly. Now, this this is amazing. So he prostrated himself again and he said, who am I? What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? He's he's amazed at this and overwhelmed at this kindness. Then the king called Saul's servant Ziba and he said, now all that belongs to Saul and all his house I have given to your master's grandson. 
You and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him. And you shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. He could get a lot of stuff done. So Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at Look at this. I love this line. Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem for he ate at the king's table regularly. That's the fourth time he said that. And he was lame in both feet. All right, what a story. And I want us to look both at David. There's much to learn from David, and there's much to learn from Mephibosheth in the story. Starting with David, I, I suggest one of the life lessons that comes out of this is this. Blessed are those who bless. Now, this is important. Blessed are those who bless. It is an aspect of faith. Now, one of the things we love about the Lord is that he blesses his people. We love that. We love to be on the receiving end of that. We love the fact that God's favor is poured out. We love to be on the receiving end of that. His kindness, his amazing um, grace. We love to be on the receiving end of that. Well, David, he was on the receiving end of God's amazing hand of blessing. But David is different than other people. It caused him to want to do something. He wants to bless the, 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 the Lord. He wants to build him a house. And so God responds, you're not the one to build me a house, but I love your heart, David. I'm going to bless you even more. Blessed are those who bless. Blessed are those who bless. You remember in the story of David bringing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord into Jerusalem, they're celebrating, they're shouting, uh, they're blowing the trumpet. David is dancing. He's so, he, this is for the Lord. And then once he uh, sets up the, ta- uh, the ark in the tent of the tabernacle, then he blesses the Lord by bringing offerings, peace offerings, and fellowship offerings. And then he blesses the people. So you know, this is the heart. That's right. Blessed are those who bless. And so he's just so filled of the fullness of God that he stands up in front of the people, right? And he declares a blessing, The blessing of God be upon you, people. What an amazing David. Blessed are those who bless. And then he he gave them all gifts. Uh, uh, A cake of bread, uh, uh, a cake of raisins, cake of figs, a portion of meads. And then they were to take this, bring that to their families, and bless their families. Now you take that blessing and bring it to your families and bless your family. David did the same. He went back to his house to bless his family. This is a deep aspect of faith. David sees the amazing hand of God. Blessed are those who bless. It is an aspect of character and of faith. We ought to be the same. Speak words of blessing. Has God blessed you? See, the reason why we forgive is because we've been forgiven. The reason why we give grace is because we've received so much. The reason why we pour the kindness of God is because we have received so much. My cup overflows. Well, that's a beautiful picture. My cup overflows onto the people around me. Speak blessing. Be a blessing. Blessed are those who bless. You see it in David. Uh, Many of you know uh, my background, I was in the restaurant business before I got into ministry and uh, I did all kinds of things. I was an owner, manager, server, dishwasher, did it all. But an interesting thing uh, I observed, you might not know this, but it's a secret in the, in the restaurant business. Christians don't make very good tippers. It, it, this, is, this is the truth. This is a fact. Christians don't make good tippers. In fact, you know, if, if there's a group of Christians coming in, the waiters were like, I'm not taking them, you take them. I'm not taking them. They don't, they don't tip. You take them. It's not my turn to take them. You take them. You know what I think? I think there's something wrong with that picture. Anybody agree with me? You know, we ought to be the ones. No, if the Christians are coming in. I got them. I got them. No, no, I got them. No, no, I got them. These, are, these people are amazing. I love their heart. I love their character and their great tippers. During the pandemic, 
especially when restaurants were like hardly serving anybody. My attitude was, I'm, I'm going to tip way more than the normal. These people, they need this, right? Be very, very generous. They need it. Amen? I, I was, it reminds me of at the Wednesday service. One of our missionaries was here, a ministry partner, and, and uh, he was talking about what they do. But he was sharing a moment when he was in a restaurant and and it was common, he says, he, he likes to engage with the server and then ask, how can I pray for you? See, when you pray for someone, it's a way of blessing them. How can I pray for you? And so she said, to his amazement, pray that I don't take my life. Can I pray for you right now? What an opportunity to speak life, to speak grace, to speak into that. Blessed are those who bless because we need to be thoughtful about the fact that there are many, many broken people in this world. And those who ought to be blessing those people are the ones who have been abundantly blessed. And we see this in David, speaking of that attitude of the heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now, Mephibosheth had every reason to be afraid because the normal process of things is that he ought to be afraid for his life. But David, I want to show you the kindness of God. He's not, he's not insecure about his leadership. He, he, I want to bless. That's what I want to do. Blessed are the peacemakers. He had the same attitude towards Saul. Even though Saul was pursuing David relentlessly to take his life, David's attitude was, you can pursue me all your life. I will not lift a hand against you. I will never be against you. And this is a... The, an attitude, an aspect of faith, isn't it? In fact, Romans chapter 12, verses 18 to 20, very famous. If possible, he writes, so far as it depends on you. So far as it depends on you means that you go as far as you can go. So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all Man, be at peace. Be a peacemaker. Speak words of life. Speak words of peace. You know, the words that come from your mouth come from the abundance of the heart, Jesus said. Out of the treasures of a man's heart does he speak. Speak blessing because that's what's filling your heart. You've got the joy of the Lord, the peace of God, the love of the Holy Spirit within you. Speak life. Be at peace. I tell you, in, the, in these days in which we are living, we are living in the most antagonistic, conflict-oriented time I've ever seen in my life. It's called social media. And I, I say Christians ought to be speaking peace, ought to be speaking life, ought to be speaking hope, ought to be speaking vision. Amen? Because there is hope. And there is life, and that's the answer to this broken world. There's an answer to this broken world, but it isn't more conflict. It's peace and love and grace. So he says, uh, be at peace with all men, and then never take your own revenge. No. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. Bless. Blessed are those who bless. If your enemy is thirsty, give him a drink. Blessed are those who bless. For in so doing you, he burning coals on his head. Matthew 5, 9 gives us the attitude of the heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. You will be like your father when you have that in your heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. You know, those beatitudes out of Matthew 5 are interesting. A lot of times people see them as you will be blessed if you do this. He said, no, actually the Beatitudes say you are blessed. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now, many of them come with a blessing that follows it. It's just like David. David wants to bless the Lord. Why? Because the Lord's blessed him, so he wants to bless God. And God says, I love that. I'm going to bless you some more. It's kind of like that. Blessed are the peacemakers, which is to say, you are already blessed because you got peace in your heart. You're blessed. Blessed are the merciful. You're already blessed because you got mercy in your heart. Blessed are the pure of heart. You're already blessed because your heart is pure. And then you bless and God will abundantly pour out more on your life. It's a powerful picture. How does this happen? We love these aspects of faith and of character. 
Where do such qualities come from? Are, are you born with these qualities? Can you, can you obtain them along the way? I suggest to you that this is one of the most important aspects of faith right here. And the answer is this. Partake of God's divine nature. This is how a person is changed, transformed. You know, we were not born with those qualities. We were born in the nature of man. We were born in the nature of Adam that we inherited all the self-focused selfishness, all the immaturity, all of the, uh, that's the nature of man. Now, Dogs are born with dog nature. Cat are born with cat nature. And that's why a dog does dog things and a cat does cat things. Because they're born with different natures. They, are, they, they do what they do because of the nature of which they were born. So for example, a dog climbs up on your bed because he wants to be with you. A cat climbs up on your bed because she likes your bed. Different nature. See, a dog looks at you as a friend. A cat looks at you as a servant. See, it's a different nature. And a, 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 a dog does not do cat things, and a cat does not do dog things. But here's the difference. A person can change. A person can change. God can change a person. God can transform. That's one of the beautiful, most powerful things about what we call the God factor. God in us is the hope of glory. By God we are transformed. When David was anointed that day by the prophet Samuel, when he poured the oil upon him, it says the spirit came upon David mightily. And then all of the wonderful things that followed David's life followed because the spirit came upon David mightily. It's the God factor. It's God in me. It's God in you. That's the power of a transformed life. God can take a person who is filled with anger and transform them into a person of gentleness who speaks peace. God can do that. God can take someone who's an alcoholic and broken and bring them into faith and to build a foundation of life. I've seen it many times. My own father was one. God can change a man. God can change a woman. God can change. God can transform. It's God in us that transforms us. In other words, you can say it this way. In the kingdom of God, there are no such things as self-help programs. In the kingdom of God, they're all God help programs. But when God helps, a life is transformed. I, I remember in my young 20s, many of you know, this was not a good time in my life. I looked at myself in the mirror one day, and I did not like the man I saw in the mirror. I had, I had known the Lord when I was a teen. I even led worship in church. But then I fell from that and went into the world and uh, went to the university and the parties and the fraternity and the, the, you name it, it was all there. And I didn't like who I became. It, it made me a person I didn't like. And I looked in the mirror one day in my young 20s and, and I saw that person and realized, what, what has happened? But I knew where hope comes from. I knew where help comes from. And I started to pray, God, help me. And if you've ever had that Holy Spirit speak to your heart moment, that was one of those Holy Spirit speak to my heart moments where I felt God says, this is how you will be changed. By walking with me, step by step, day by day. You stay with me step by step, day by day. You will be transformed. I think, I think it, it, it was one of those amazing moments where I believed it. This is God giving me a promise. I will change you. I will change you. But you walk with me step by step, day by day, and you will see it. And I'll tell you what, it changed my life. Can I give you a verse, actually a set of verses that's amazing? 2 Peter 1, verses 3 to 9. Write this down, memorize it, write it on your heart, write it on, take a, a stone tablet and chisel, chisel it. It's that important. His divine power has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that, now here's the thing, 
so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. That you may become partakers or sharers in the divine nature. It's God in me. It's God in you. Partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. That's a deep word right there. But notice, for this very reason, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. He's now going to describe a transformed life. If you've you've ever wondered, what does God mean when he speaks of a transformed life? He's now going to define it. If you've ever wondered, what is it? Here it is. In your faith, supply moral excellence. God wants us to have moral excellence added to faith. It's, faith is the foundation by which we have a relationship to God. And then supply to that moral excellence. And to your moral excellence, knowledge. Grow in a knowledge of him. And in your knowledge, self-control. This is a character quality of God in your life. And in your self-control, perseverance, step by step, day by day, walk in the perseverance of it. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. Now, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, God wants these qualities to be yours and to have these qualities increase. They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's a double negative. Let me put it in the positive. If you have these qualities and are increasing, they render you useful and fruitful. If you've ever wanted to be useful and fruitful, have these qualities. They make you useful and fruitful in the kingdom. But he who lacks these qualities... Is blind or short sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Like, never forget what God did in the, in the purifying, in the forgiving, because it makes you very thankful and then it makes you want to be transformed. I don't want to go back, I don't want to be who I once was, I want to be transformed into this. And it's a powerful understanding. These beautiful qualities of faith and character come from partaking in the divine nature. It is God in you. It's God in me. It's the sap of the tree that gives it life. Without the sap in the tree, it's dead. It bears no fruit. Its leaves wither. That's the Holy Spirit. That's God in us that brings life, that bears fruit, that causes the leaves to be green in every season. Now, Great lessons from David. Let's turn to Mephibosheth before my time runs out. Mephibosheth, great lessons. And here's here's a great lesson. Life is found at the king's table. Four times it says that David invited Mephibosheth to eat at the king's table. And it says, as one of the king's sons. Now, this is beautiful. Picture, it's actually... You know, Jesus is called the son of David, right? So in many ways, David is a picture of the, uh, uh, the great Messiah. David, in the spirit, understands this word and calls that coming Messiah his Lord. Such is David, recognizing the future king. Well, that invitation of the future king stands. Revelation 19.19 19 is one place. Then he, the angel, said to me, John, the writer, write this down. Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Isn't that a beautiful picture? You are invited. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, these are the true words of God. I love Revelation 3.20. I love quoting it. I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says. If anyone hears my voice... And opens a door, I will come into him. But then he says, and I will dine with him. And he with me. Ah, beautiful picture of that relationship. In other words, it's not just the eating, it's the fellowship. It's not just the eating. It's the fellowship that happens at the table. 
That's the point of the invitation. It's that fellowship that will transform you there at the king's table. The conversation will enlighten your soul, will inspire hope, will give vision for your life. He will speak purpose to you at the king's table. He will speak a, a, a calling, a mission to you. He will speak into your character. He'll open your eyes to all that's good and right. Now, having said that, I also say, it's not just the fellowship, it's also the eating. <laughs> what you eat at the king's table is abundantly, beautifully a picture of what God does when you partake of the divine nature. The partaking is, a, it's like, you know, the scripture over and over uses the idea of food uh, as, as nourishment, as strength to the soul, milk of the word, manna of the word, the meat of the word, you know, what you put into your soul, the vegetables of the word, we could call it, will bring forth, uh, you know, the transformed life. Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste of it. Partake of it. See, in other words, it has to become part of you. It's far more than an intellectual ascent. Oh, I see. It's a beautiful thing to perceive. No, no, you don't just perceive it. You partake of it. It's got to be part of you. That's the beautiful part of it. It's not a mental ascent. It's not an emotional ascent. It's not an intellectual ascent. It's the partaking. Taste it, and you'll see that the Lord is good. Isaiah 55, great chapter. One of my favorite ones. There's many in Isaiah. Ho, everyone who thirsts. The word Hebrew, uh, the word ho in Hebrew is a great word. It means, listen up, peoples. Ho, ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come. Buy and eat. You have no money. You live in Lodabar. It's a nowhere place in a nowhere town, and you're lame in both feet, and you've been dropped somewhere along the way. Come, you who have no money. Eat at the king's table. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Mephibosheth, there's no charge here. You sit at my table anytime. Eat of the abundance of the king's table. Don't live in Lodabar anymore. Move to Jerusalem. Then he asked this question. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? Why do you spend your wages for what does not satisfy? That is a really good question. That is a really good question. It's a very deep question. Why do you spend your money on that? That doesn't satisfy the soul. There's nothing good that comes from that. Listen, he says, listen carefully to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance. He's speaking of spiritual things here now. Delight yourself. Delight. God does not serve sour grapes at the table of the king. These are delicious, delightful, wonderful things, beautiful things. At the king's table are beautiful things. Delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me and listen that you may live. I tell you, there's, a, there's so much in the world that people partake of that's not good. Why do you spend your money for what does not satisfy? They, they're eating the, 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 the ding-dongs and Twinkies of the world, you could say. I used to love ding-dongs and Twinkies and Doritos. But there's nothing in them, right? They're just, they're, they're, they don't satisfy. They, make you, they leave you yucky. They leave you feeling yucky. God invites you to the table to partake of that which will satisfy. Delight yourself in that which is good. Lastly, we'll close with this. God's heart is to restore. I love this scene. Verse 7, don't fear. You have no reason to fear. Well, you had reason to fear, but don't fear. I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul. When Mephibosheth woke up that morning, he woke up in Lodabar. Lame in both feet, without hope, 
without a future and fear in his heart. Before that day is over, Mephibosheth has been given a permanent place to eat at the abundance of the king's table, and he's had all of the land of his grandfather given and restored to him. Oh, what a powerful picture is that. Because there are many people that are like Mephibosheth. They're li- they've been living in Lodabar all their lives. Someone dropped them along the way, and they've been lame ever since. God gives an invitation. This is a beautiful picture. I, that you could, this is amazing. God is giving an invitation. Move from Lodabar and come near to the, the, the city. Live in the city. This is where the Ark of the Covenant is. This is where the glory of God is. This is the nearness of God. Come, and then you can sit at my table regularly. Would you notice something? He doesn't give him an invitation and say, come to my dinner you know, next Thursday. I give you an invitation, and that's it. I just give you the one invitation. Come Thursday, and then we're done. No, that's not what he said. He said, you can sit at my table like one of the king's sons. You eat at my table every day. Every day I sit at my table, I would love to see you there, Mephibosheth, every day. Now, this is beautiful. God is giving an invitation, and he says to you, every day, come partake, eat every day. It is that steadfastness that will transform you. Every day, partake of. Every day, God will bring that which is good. God, he'll speak life every day. Every day, he'll speak life. I'll tell you what, you you dwell in the nearness of God every day. Something's going to happen to your life. He's going to, that, you, you're going to be transformed. Your, your soul, your spirit will arise because he's going to build day by day. You walk with me step by step, day by day. You'll see it. It'll change the heart. It'll change the character. And it will be beautiful. Blessed are those who have these qualities Because once you have these qualities, you're just blessed in the having of them. And let them be ever increasing. Stay, stay, draw near to me. Eat at my table every day. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for revealing to us this amazing invitation. So many people have lived in a place like Lodabar all their lives. Someone dropped them along the way and they've been lame ever since. Can't help themselves, can't walk. No provision, no thing. And then one day, an invitation. I will restore to you. I will restore it all. And you can sit at my table every day church this is beautiful but God wants us to respond to that invitation how many today would say God I want to sit at the table of the king I want to partake of that which is good every day I want to walk with you step by step day by day I want to be transformed because of it Church, would you just say yes to the Lord by raising your hand and just saying to the Lord, step by step, day by day, I want to be with you. I want to be at that place where that soul is made alive. Father, we raise our hands to you as a way of saying, I ask, I desire, I want to have these in my life. I honor you for it all now. In Jesus' powerful name, and everyone said, amen. Let's give the Lord praise and glory and honor. Amen. Amen. Church, let's receive.